Let's start that list again. Shemua, the son of Zakur, Saphat, the son of Harai, Ilgal, the son of Joseph, Palti, the son of Raphu, Gadil, the son of Zodai, Gadai, the son of Sushi, Emil, the son of Gamali, Sethur, the son of Michael, Nabai, the son of uh, Voshi, and Guel, the son of Machai. How many of you recognize those ten names? Anybody? Okay, how about these two names? Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, the son of Nun. If you recognize those names, raise your hand. See, the first ten were the names of the ten spies who the Scripture says brought back an evil report of unbelief. The last two, actually the Scripture and God said about Joshua and Caleb that these were two men who had a different spirit than the other ten. They were men of hope. They were men of faith. They were righteous men that came back with a good report when God said it's time to possess the promised land. This morning, as we continue in the challenge series, I want to talk to you about the challenge of building a legacy. If you remember, we are in a 90-day period in which we are taking the challenge of reaching upward and inward and outward, which is the vision of our church and our community. Uh, the vision of reaching upward where we learn how to have communion with God, uh, reaching inward where we learn to understand the power of community, as we've experienced this morning, just a small part of that power, and then learning how to reach outward as we learn to make a contribution. So we move from communion to community to contribution, because it's in the contribution that our lives truly become defined by the kingdom of heaven as it's manifesting itself on earth. The things you will be remembered for, the things that I will be remembered for, are not how much you and I have received in life and accumulated, but on the contrary, it's going to be the contributions of our lives that are going to define how you and I will be remembered. Psalms 112 verse 6 says in the New American Standard Version, our text this morning, the righteous will be remembered forever. What's he talking about? Church, he's talking about. David, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he's talking about the power of legacy. Say that with me this morning, legacy. Remember the story of Cain and Abel? Uh, as a portion of that's recorded in uh, Hebrews chapter 11, the um, book of the heroes or the chapter of the heroes of faith. And in verse 4, it talks about how that, that Abel offered a more excellent sacrifice than his brother Cain did. And he obtained a witness that because of the way he brought this offering and the way that he responded to God's request, evidently God had asked him both to bring an offering. But the way that Cain brought the offering was not acceptable to God, probably because Cain was doing it on his terms. But Abel, he came and he brought, and we're going to talk about this next week as a part two to this, he brought his offering according to the requirements, specifications, and mandate of the Creator. And the Scripture says he obtained a witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts. God stood up and has testified throughout history of the faithfulness, the obedience, and the sacrifice of Abel. Of course, you know the story how Cain rose up in jealousy and killed his brother Abel. And the Scripture says, listen to this, through it... His testimony in his life, Abel, being dead, he still speaks and speaks and speaks. How? Church, through his legacy. And I've got a word for you today. You are legacy makers. Amen? You were created by God to affect generations coming behind you. You were created by the God that we worship this morning to leave your mark, 
to be remembered, to make a difference, to live for a cause that is higher and greater than yourself, a cause that exists outside of yourself. Today, God is calling you and I to step outside of ourselves so we can give ourselves to that cause. And when we do that, we begin to form our legacy. It doesn't matter where you are in life, you can be a legacy maker. It doesn't matter whether you're 10 years old or whether you're 80 years old. A couple months ago, Charles Colson went into eternity and passed from this earth. Some of you remember him as the Nixon aide who was arrested in the Watergate scandal and went to prison. But it was in that place of brokenness and failure that he found Christ. Charles Colson went on because he made a decision that his past and his failures were not going to define his present and his future. He made a decision to draw the line in the sand. Even though he was past halfway in his life. That he make a decision that he was going to leave a different kind of legacy behind. And he went on to, find, to found prison fellowship that today has 50,000 volunteers in 88 countries going into prisons and millions and millions of men and women have come to Christ because of his ministry. And the choice he made not to allow his past to define his future and more importantly, church, his legacy. Don't allow the enemy, don't allow problems, don't allow people to rob you of your legacy potential. Because you are going to have opportunities every day, every week, every month, every year for setbacks to come along the way, to get you off track. And you've you got to push them aside. You've got to push the enemy aside. You've got to push those problems aside. Sometimes you have to push people aside from keeping you from being in that legacy-making process. Now get this, church. You've got two kinds of legacy that you can build. You can build an earthly legacy, but you can also build an eternal legacy. See, the earthly legacy is a legacy that you're going to leave behind. That's what you're going to be remembered for on planet Earth. But did you know that there's a second and really a more important kind of legacy that you can build? And that's a legacy that you are going to send ahead into eternity, not to be remembered for, but to be rewarded for. And the Scripture is very clear that there is going to be a day that is going to come for all of us as believers. There's two judgments in the Scripture. There's the judgment seat of Christ, and then there is the white throne of judgment that we find in the book of Revelation. The first one is a judgment of rewards. The second is a judgment of condemnation. So you and I, because of the, the love and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the passion of God for you and I, we do not have to stand in the second judgment. Jesus stood at that judgment for you and I at Calvary. And when he said, it is finished. He was making a declaration over you and I that you and I would never have to stand before that judgment because the Father had poured out all of the judgment and the wrath for you and I as His sons and daughters upon His Son Jesus. So much so that He was somehow, and we don't fully comprehend and understand how that the, the second person of the Godhead could feel a sense of separation from the first person of the Godhead, the Father, when he said, my God, my God, why, has you, why have you forsaken me? And there was this sense of separation because the wrath and the judgment was so profound. What's the point? You and I will never have to stand before the white, the white throne of judgment, which is a judgment of condemnation. The first judgment is our judgment. That's when the rapture occurs and you and I are taken out of this earth and and in a moment's time, the scripture says we're going to be changed in a twinkling of an eye and we are going to see him face to face and he is going to reward us for the deeds done in our bodies. He said some of our deeds are going to be like wood, hay, and stubble and they're going to burn up in the fire of his presence. And he said there's going to be some deeds that are like silver and gold. And how many of you know that when silver and gold are exposed to, to heat and fire, they are refined, aren't they? They get purer. They shine. And that's going to happen to you and I. 
is we are going to be rewarded for the deeds that are done in our body. In that time, why? Because that's what our earthly legacy is. It's transformed into eternal legacy becomes. And so we need to be mindful that there's two. One we're leaving behind, one we are sending into the future. And over the next couple of weeks, I want to look at four contributing factors to what we would define as a godly legacy. And this morning, we're just going to look at simply two of those. The first one, people are asking, how do I build a legacy that has meaning? The first one is real simple, living with integrity. That's the base foundation. For the past 30 years, we have had a most admired man's list. While presidents and politicians and stars and athletes have come and gone, there's one person who has remained in the top three for that entire period of time, and his name's Billy Graham. Why? Because of integrity. What you see is what you get. What's integrity? Integrity is simply composed of three activities. Number one, telling the truth. Number two, keeping your word. And number three, practicing what you say you believe. Sounds easy. How many of you know that it's not so easy? Proverbs 25, 4 says, broken promises are worse than rain clouds that don't bring rain. How many of you living in Northeast Ohio this summer are thankful for the rain? We've had a lot of clouds, but very little rain. Anybody here ever broke a promise before? I hate when I do that. In case you've forgotten, let me jog your memory. Here are some common unkept promises. I'll return it when I'm done. I won't tell anyone that you told me this. The check's in the mail. Honey, I will be home at 6 o'clock. We are going to go through membership class soon. Son, we can play this weekend. We'll do it when things settle down. Or how about this one? This really hits home. My diet is going to begin tomorrow. (laughs) Anybody ever said that before? If you want to be a legacy maker, you have to work on keeping your word. Is that easy? Is it easy to live with integrity? Absolutely not. More often than not, it's going to cost you something. It's easy to impress people from afar, but real integrity is when those who know you the best respect you the most. First in your home, then in your community of faith, and then in the place that you work. If you make a mistake, church, don't get down on yourself. Pick yourself up. Do it again. Don't let that mistake define you. See, sometimes we get paralyzed by our failures. We get paralyzed by our mistakes. And, you know, that's the work of the enemy. Why? Because, you know, what? he can't just take from you what, what God has given to you in his promises and in the inheritance that, that Christ purchased for us. But you know what? He can deceive you into giving it up. And, man, I'll tell you what, when you make a mistake, he is right there to hammer you, to beat you up, to push you down. Anybody know what I'm talking about this morning? See, that's where we live. But you know what? Jesus, he wants to lift you up. He wants to breathe life into you. He wants to encourage you to say, hey, don't give up. Do it again. Get it right. For each time you do it right, you're building upon the number one character trait of a lasting legacy, and that's living with integrity. Number two is serving with intensity. Study after study after study shows that when children are asked what they want to be in life. Not one time has any study ever shown a child responding this way, I want to be a servant. Ever. Why? Because we don't want to be servants. We want to be celebrities and stars and winners and leaders. Yet Jesus said in Mark chapter 10, verse 43, whoever wants to be great among you must first become a servant. Matthew 20, 25, he said, Your attitude must be like my own, for I did not come to be served, but to serve. I mean, do we really believe that, church? Do 
Do we really believe in following Jesus and like doing the things that he said we ought to do because that's the way he lived his life? See, for the church to be taken seriously in this culture, we need to stand up and start thinking, talking, and more importantly, acting the way Jesus acted with authenticity and transparency. And you know what will happen? The church will rise up and it will take its rightful place. And an army will be released into all of the hopelessness, all the despair, all the brokenness, and all the confusion. I don't know about you, but it doesn't look like that things are getting better from a natural viewpoint. Our economic challenges seem to be getting more complicated. Why? Because the ways of man, when we are left to ourselves, always end in brokenness and confusion, don't they? That's only when the kingdom of God comes down to earth and the light begins to shine in the darkness. Do, do things start to come into alignment? And you know what? We are in a time like that. What does it mean to serve the way that Jesus served? Church, it's real simple. Number one, you've got to be available. And number two, learn to be faithful. God's not so much interested, though he will use your ability. He is more interested in your availability. It doesn't matter how gifted and talented and, and wonderful you are or skilled or what your expertise is. If you're not making any of that available to Jesus, it means nothing. In the scope of eternity, it is going to pass. He's interested in your availability and your faithfulness. I've come to the conclusion that the world has very few extraordinary people truly uniquely gifted individuals. But the world is filled with ordinary people committed to great causes and great purposes who are out doing it. So we were in Baltimore this week as a part of uh, a ministry there called uh, the City Outreach. Just a, just a powerful, we took our youth group and Joel and Anna and the kids are still there and they're just doing a tremendous um, week of ministry. Very, very exciting. We met a young girl named Colleen. So we're in the projects, and we're ministering to children, uh, and she feels this calling to just stay and just minister to these, these kids. And I mean, they're just like all over the place. Morning, afternoon, evening, no supervision, just young children that need to be loved and touched and cared for. She just gets this burden, and she decides to go out and raise money, and she wants to do this full time. And you know what? Every day she's there 24-7. And a Baptist church with an elderly congregation right in the middle of the projects, they were, must, must have been moving out, they saw her work. Not even affiliated, Colleen, with a, with a Baptist movement or denomination. They said, listen, we want to give to your ministry this building, this church building, and this property to you because of how you have responded to this burden and this calling in your life. One of the most ordinary people you'd ever meet, Colleen. And you know what, church? She's doing it 24-7. She's there in that building. They're doing crafts. They play games. They're cared for. They have services on Wednesday night. They preach the gospel. They play basketball. I mean, and, you know, so for six months she's had kids coming, and not one parent showed up to see what was happening. Month six, one of the mothers showed up and said, I suppose I should come by and see where my son has been all this time. And you're talking about another generation where there's brokenness and confusion and hurt being passed on. And here's Colleen, man. She's picked up her ministry. She said, Lord, here I am. Use me. You know. And she's faithful. She's doing it faithfully. And I want to encourage you here this morning. You don't have to be at the head of your class, the most brilliant, the most wonderful, the most talented, or the most beautiful. In fact, chances are real high you're probably not. So turn to your neighbor and say, you're not. You may not be a standout, but I'm here to tell you, you can leave a legacy. You can leave one behind you. You can send one into eternity because you have gifts that God has given to you. God has anointed you. He has called you. 
You know, the Bible says that God has placed every one of us in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. When Paul was using the body metaphor, he said, he said that the Father has placed every one of us in the body as it's pleased Him. Where's your place? Are you in your place in this body? And the number one pointer is your spiritual gifts, which we test for in our membership classes. And we will help you discover and use. Why? Because that's what you're going to give an account for when you come to the end of your journey and stand before Jesus. And he's going to reward you. And the scripture says that for those who have been available and faithful, read the parable of the talents and the Olivet Discourse. He said, Jesus is going to say to those who have been available and faithful, well done, thy good and thy faithful servant. You have been faithful and little. I am going to make you ruler over much. We call that promotion. See, that is going to be a time of promotion. And he said, then enter into the joy of the Lord. So there's three things that are going to be spoken over people who are faithful, who were available. He said, number one, you are going to be affirmed. Number two, you are going to be promoted. And number three, there's going to be an incredible celebration in heaven over the fact that you did those things while you were on planet Earth. You served a greater cause in the midst of all of the pain, heartache, brokenness, problems, attacks that we all endure as Christians in this journey. Anybody got any problems? Put your hand up real high. Man, life is full of problems. I like what Rick Warren said. He said, you know what? You are either in a problem, on your way out of a problem, or you're going into a problem. That's life. Isn't it, church, for you and me? We're either in, on our way out, or on our way in. And that's just how life is. But see, when we choose in the midst of all of those battles to make decisions to be available and to be faithful, you know what? God is going to rejoice. He's rejoicing in heaven right now as you're picking up your ministry and serving. Some of you, don't man, do not minimize the fact that you are working with children and teenagers and preschoolers behind the scenes. You know what? Your audience is heaven. Your audi you're playing to the, to the music of one. And he's in heaven watching, and, and the Scripture tells us in the second judgment, the judgment, uh, the white throne judgment, that they're going to be opening up books. He's keeping track. He's watching. So it doesn't matter if, if Pastor Michael doesn't see what you're doing, and he doesn't get a chance to affirm you and congratulate you. You know what? You are playing to the music of one who was much greater than I. He is keeping track of the Scripture says every deed that is done in the body is being recorded. And how many of you are grateful that those deeds that we do not care for anybody to know has been washed away and thrown, the Scripture says, into the sea of forgetfulness? Church, we call that grace. But you know what? We have an opportunity. Not that you and I could ever pay God back for what He's done for us. You and I can never pay Jesus back for the sacrifice He made. But you know what? We can express our gratitude. We need to become a grateful people. How do you do that? You do it by picking up your ministry. Those of you who are the link to your family and you are persecuted and you are rejected and you keep inviting them and you keep asking them, he is taking note. And the Bible says that he is a God of household salvation. And I want to encourage you because it took 20 years for me as the link to my family to watch every one of my family members come to Christ. But I want to tell you, it did not come without great heartache cost and pain. Tremendous battles and struggles. Why? Because the enemy does not give up territory very easily. See, church, we need a wake-up call. We need to realize that we are living behind enemy lines. This earth in its present state is not your home. Heaven is your home. You are living against the backdrop of eternity. So guess what? This is the only hell that you and I will ever know. And the best is yet to come. So be encouraged. Fight the good fight of faith. Don't throw in the towel. Serve. Give. When the enemy's hammering and banging on your door and bombarding your minds with all kinds of, of thoughts of confusion and disconnection and discouragement and all the things we struggle with, you know what you need to do? You need to give and serve. That's how you push him back. That's how you break the stronghold of the enemy. He fears 
when you come to church on Sunday morning. He fears when you go to that Bible study. He fears when you do the 90-day challenge and you pick up this book and you start to read it and believe it. And, oh, God, when you start acting upon it, look out, man. He is broken. His power is broken. Church, what are we talking about? We're talking about building a legacy. How? By living with integrity and serving with intensity. You may not be a stand-up, but you can leave a legacy. You don't have to waste your life on things Jesus said won't last. And here's what we do. We give ourselves to fame and fortune and status and pleasure and power. And you know what? None of those things Jesus said are going to last. In fact, most of those will be broken before you and I come to the end of our journey. Most of them will be broken before you and I die. Jesus said there's only two things that will last for eternity. Don't miss this. You need to write this down. Number one is the truth which we will learn from throughout all eternity. And number two is people. Those are the only two things that you and I are able to invest in that will last for eternity. So when you contribute to those two eternal realities, that's when your legacy is truly launched. When you're living with integrity, serving with intensity, the truth and people, that's when you begin to align yourself with Jesus and eternity. That's when you begin to become a legacy maker. So in Baltimore, we spent a day at the city mission. Bobby, I wish you could have been with us and Bonnie because uh, there in the city mission, uh, they call it, what's the name of the? Helping Up is the name of their city mission. I can tell you, it's, it's one of these state-of-the-art missions in the entire country. Never seen a place quite like this. But as we were going on the tour, there was a man named Frank who had been there for three years. He's now worked himself through the program, and he's now one of the leaders who takes people on a tour. And what a, what a blessing Frank was. Joe was, a, was his assistant, and we want to ask you to pray for Frank and Joe that God would just launch them into the fullness of their destiny. So as we're going on a tour, we, we see this. He takes us into the library, and we see this beautiful sketch. I think it was of a cat. He begins to tell us a story about a 60-year-old man who comes into the not too long ago, he comes into the mission there and is broken. Um, third grade education, substance abuse, goes through the program. And see, one of their beliefs is that everybody has a hidden talent. That when they make themselves available and they're faithful, God will use it to do great things and to make a difference. They discover this man, he's an artist. He can paint, he can draw. So they have a fundraiser they do every year, and there's 1,600 people come. They got companies that come because they're training many of these, these men to um, go back into the workforce. And there's a company from Australia that sees his paintings and his drawings. They offer him $150,000 to come set up a studio because they, are, they want to, with their businesses, is they print in large quantities and reproduce paintings and sketches and artwork. Here's an artist. He's 60 years old. He just finished his GED. You know what he said to them? He said, I'm going to have to decline. Because you know what? I have something different that I'm supposed to give my life to. So now he does his artwork, and his artwork is in retailers like, I think, Target and... He's in police stations. And you know what he takes his money and what he does with it? He takes the money he raises from that artwork and he puts it back and he reinvests it and in the city mission, helping others to stand up. Because he realized that he had a higher calling and a higher cause. What's your excuse today? You know how he learned how to draw? The farm he grew up in, he would draw pictures in the dirt. And that's how he honed his talent. This man was investing in two legacies, church, an earthly legacy that he was going to leave behind that he'll be remembered for in that place, but more importantly, an eternal legacy that is reaching forward into eternity. This one he will be rewarded for in the life to come. Now, I don't know if you realize this, but every one of us this morning, we have been dramatically affected by the actions and the legacies of two men that will affect our eternity. The Bible refers to them as the first and the second Adam. The first Adam 
he fell in the garden. And because he was our representative and we are his offspring, we too have fallen. In fact, that's our default position. His fallenness brought consequences, separation, alienation. You and I were born, as David said, into sin, separated from God. But a second Adam, the scripture says, came along. His name was Jesus. He broke the curse. He made it possible for that default switch to be flipped and to be changed, for you and I to be restored into right relationship with God, to receive eternal life, and to be able to give ourselves to a cause that truly would make a difference in this life and the life to come. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 22, we're going to pray here in just a moment, says, for as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all shall be made alive again. Two men, two legacies, two choices, two destinies. Church, the Bible says you have been given an inheritance. Jesus said, it's a gift. You can't earn it. You can't buy it. You cannot. It's impossible for you to bargain for it. It's a gift. As a son and a daughter, he is calling you to come back, but you cannot be a part of the family of God with a default position in the place it is before you come to Christ. Why? Because your life has been affected. Your legacy is being affected by the first Adam. In order for it to become aligned with the second Adam, Christ, you've got to receive the gift. So there's this young man who receives an inheritance from a family member. $400,000 is left to his name. And he refuses it. And the lawyers of the estate said, you have to take it. He said, I don't want it. He said, you've got to take it. Legally, you're required to possess it. He said, no. They sued him to take possession of that inheritance. And he countersued. And he won. Church, God's not going to force himself on you. It's a gift. John said, John chapter 1, for as many as received him, he gave them the right, the power, and the privilege to become the sons and the daughters of Almighty God. So today he's making an offer to you. In fact, he knew when you were still in your mother's womb that you would be here today and that an offer would be made to you for that default position to change. You can't earn it. I don't care if you've gone to church, been confirmed, baptized, you never can earn your way into heaven. It's a gift. And see, you start building your eternal legacy when you cross over the line and you surrender your heart to him and you allow him to be Lord and Savior of your life. And with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, as that offer has been made to you today, if you're here this morning and you want that eternal legacy. Maybe you're engaging the earthly legacy, but your eternal legacy is not in full motion because you know what? You, you don't know that you know that you know if this was your last day on planet Earth that heaven is your home and you need Christ and you need God in your life this morning. You want to receive that gift. You want to receive your inheritance. The Bible says the only way you can do that is by faith. Just simply receiving and surrendering your heart and your life to Him and God will begin to change you. If you've never done that and you want me to pray for you this morning, just quickly put your hand up and say, Michael, pray for me this morning. I want to receive him as Lord and Savior of my life. Thank you. Thank you. Are there others? You need to take that step this morning. Maybe you're watching online or listening, and you need to take this step. This is your opportunity, and we're going to pray. And how do you do that? By surrendering your heart in prayer. You just receive it. He knows your heart. He sees your heart today. Thank you. Others. Raise your hand if that's you. Or maybe you need to rededicate your life to him. Thank you for being bold enough to do that. You need to rededicate your life to Christ. You've been on the fence, yet you're not where you know you need to be. You are a Christian. You need to rededicate your life. Put your hand up and put it down. I want to pray for you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is your moment. This is a moment in time that's going to define us in our legacies. If you raised your hand, I want you to pray this prayer with me. If you didn't raise your hand, but you want to, just pray it with us. God will do a work in your heart. A miracle is going to happen. Those of you online, he's calling you. Pray this with me. Say, Lord Jesus, I surrender all to you. I make a decision today to let go 
and let you take control. I invite you into my heart, Lord, to be my Lord and Savior, to change that default position. I turn from my sin, and I turn to you in faith, and I receive your forgiveness. I receive the gift of eternal life, and I receive that peace and assurance that I'm right with you, and that heaven is my home. And I thank you for that. In Christ's name I pray. Let's congratulate those who made that commitment for the first time or as an act of rededication.